yeah, thanks for coming back. I'm trying to think of all the fun things we've tweaked since last time you were here. Lighting, we just kind of, gosh, in the last three weeks, we went from G5s to G6s on all the tanks where there were radions. Still run kind of a, a mix of lighting. OR bars, radions over on the right side of the tank, left side of the tank, we've got two G6 Pros, which are the little bit wider panels. I mean, you can kind of see a little bit in the shot. I have them both set to AB+, but they do AB+, a little differently as far as how much power it'll put out. The lights come on on the tank you're seeing right now at 6 a.m., and they go off about 6.30 p.m. I have them kind of go, you know, sunrise, sunset, so they go from right to left and left to right. Yeah, so run about that, probably a little more, you know, par throughout the day than, you know, they need, but it's, you know, it's the times of day that I'm down here and I want to see it is usually 6 a.m. I'm down here, um, you know, before the kids go to school, just kind of having first cup of coffee, checking everything out. Loving that polyp extension from the night as soon as the lights turn on at six. That's probably my favorite time to see it. And then right before the lights go out too, like 6.30 or so at night is, uh, is also, I don't know, one of my favorite times to just kind of see everything getting ready for night. Colors are usually just super popping. It's, you know, obviously in the AB plus, that's where you get the blues. And then I've got the OR bars that are always blue. So, and then from 8 a.m. till I think 4 p.m., probably longer than it needs to be. I have that 400 watt radium bulb um, that I just can't seem to get rid of. I, I just love that, you know, kind of shallow reef shimmer that that gives in there. The growth tips I see in that area, and you can probably see it on camera a little bit too, is it's definitely brighter in that area. And it also, par wise, has got to be pushing almost a, a thousand through that, that eight hour period, which is probably a little more than it needs to be. But again, everything looks happy over there. I don't put any things that I know, you know, need lower light. So right. everything over there can, can handle it and, and seems to thrive in it. Some of them you can tell, you know, I mean, with the coloring pigments being kind of their suntan lotion, you can tell with some corals that they'll just like lather up their, their highest protection in that area and maybe they don't look as pretty then. But some of the others, it does the opposite where it brings out some of the most brilliant colors. Most of that left side is in that 250 to 400 area. That's kind of what we aim for too. Um, maybe closer to the 300 to 400 for most of the range. And then on the edges towards the glass, you know, it's probably closer to that. 250 to three and a quarter, maybe somewhere in there. So just from a parameter perspective, every Saturday morning, I kind of do my battery of tests. We don't run water changes on this. It's kind of a modified Triton or modified moonshiners type method. We mix all of our own elements up to whatever concentration. We just do that consistently. We dose those according to what the previous month and current month's ICP is. So we'll take the previous month's, we'll take the current month, make an adjustment. see if it went up or went down, how much did it go up or go down, and then we have constant dosing of trace elements, right? So we basically take all of our salt-based trace elements, so your fluoride and, and uh, you know, about a dozen other things. Most of the things you'd see commonly on the moonshiners and then one or two other things. And then we put them in DI water and we have a calculator so we know how much DI water to put in for X number of days, right? So we'll mix up our iodine, barium, molybdenum, nickel, manganese, chromium, cobalt, iron, haven't played with copper yet, but we measure it obviously with the ICPs, selenium, vanadium, zinc, and rubidium, right? So those are the ones where we're basically putting a mixture together, the amount of each of those that we need into a larger amount of DI water. And then that gets dosed, I think 50 times a day on our GHL doser. We've seen great results from that, right? And we also see things being measurable the following month on the ICP. So, you know, non-chemist skills tell me that things aren't interacting with each other in that mixture. It's working so far. Some of the things we'll pull out that we dose individually, strontium we just started because every month on the ICP we'd be low, you know, not bad, but like six, seven, where we'd like it more nine, 10. So I think we use Brightwell strontium. I just make a liter up at a time. We dose that now daily as well. So it's like three or four mils a day in this system, which is 600 gallons total over the uh, three or four tanks. You know, this is the first month we've done it and that kept us at like nine and a half. So boom, we're happy with that now. Is there any specific minor element that you notice right off the bat that made a difference or you just one hole in and you tried all of them? When we first started doing, maybe two years ago, we started um, kind of delving into the moonshiners. It was you know eye-opening for all the reasons everybody has mentioned, right? That we're kind of starving our corals. I was a little skeptical of the, you know, doing no water changes, but again, once you start doing it, it's a head twist where you're like, oh, okay, I feel comfortable with this now. And as long as you're able to take out those proteins and things that the corals use to fight with each other and some of the waste products and, and stuff like that, you can either do that through a little bit of carbon, we do that through ozone. Once an hour, you can actually hear it going buzzing in the background here now. It's going into our skimmer. I think it runs five minutes every hour. 
seems to be fine, right? We've been doing that now for a year and a half. We've been doing, you know, no water changes until recently. I just had to do one because our sulfate, yeah, our S was high. We were up around 1098, 1094 in August and September. So then we did a couple weeks of water changes just to kind of bring that down. Our chloride was also a little high, probably because all the traces that we're doing chlorides, right? They're all salts. So we do calcium reactor, we do calcwasser, and we do three part with sodium hydroxide. And anybody's trying that, please, you know, hand protection, eye protection, it's kind of dangerous stuff, right? But once you dose that as part of your three part, you know, any pH problems you're having will absolutely go away. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> calcium reactor comes on at pH of 8.15. So think of it like mid morning, once the tank's pH goes, it goes down, I would say our range is probably 8.08 .08 at night to about 8.37 in the day. And then that goes through till probably 10, 11 at night. And then at night it switches over to the three part, which doses currently that calcium reactor is at 6.25 pH in the chamber. So I tear through a lot of the last 20 years, 25 years of dead skeletons. I have buckets and buckets from- That's where you do it. Yeah. I just wanted to ask which So that's the media, media. yep. Um, we'll throw a little, uh, you know, dolomite in there every once in a while so you get the magnesium out of it, but- How much phosphates you get? <laughs> not, right. yeah, not that. I mean, this tank is starved for phosphates and nitrates, oh, okay. right? So, kind of so the, what you see here is sucking down the nitrates and phosphates more than I can, you know, do via feeding and stuff. So at night, that three part kicks in, which part A is just calcium chloride, part B is the sodium hydroxide that we mix up, and then part C is Tropic Marin part C. The thought being there is that you are putting your three part in, and obviously we're not dead on because we had to do those water changes with the chloride. Um, but the idea is that you're keeping everything in ionic balance so that part C is basically, you know, minus your major salts and it has all the other elements in there to kind of keep everything in balance from the A and B. And then Calquasser is going constantly based on the alkalinity. So if our alkalinity, which is all done by the alkatronic, right, if that drops and it's tied into the apex. So if apex sees that drop below, let's say, I forget what it is, but maybe around eight, it'll yeah, it'll, it'll be dosing calcwasser as well. We just do the clear calcwasser. We had done the slurry in the past. When we did the three part, we just didn't see the need for it. And obviously that slurry comes with a lot of right. cleaning of, yeah, you know, yeah. tubing yeah, and that's what we were talking last time. clogging and all of that. So, so far this has been just easier, right? Like I mentioned, we have that solution with the elements put together. All that stuff gets dosed 50 times a day. So a little over two times an hour. And then the ones that I need more of, fluorine and- We do those separately. Yeah, that, that just doses by itself. Does it manganese, do you, do you mix that as well or is that separate? Yeah, manganese is in the main mixture. I could probably include the fluorine in there too, but I just haven't done it yet. Cause that was the first thing that we actually mixed up to kind of dose by itself. Just because nitrate and phosphate has been close to zero, we dose like five mils a day of amino. Right now we're on Brightwell, but I have like seven liters of the red C, A, and B. So I may start switching to that. The pain there is I gotta only put seven days worth of dosing in there cause it has to be chilled. With the Brightwell, I don't, everything I've read doesn't need to be chilled. So we just have that thing sitting there. It stirs it up and doses that, but that's kind of our, you know, amino. And then we do um, the NP back to balance, which again, helps keep a little bit of nitrate, a little bit of phosphate. And then, you know, we've kept a little bit of an eye on carbon over the years um, with the Triton test, the NDOC test, which is like an ICP. Think of that for your nitrogen and for your uh, carbon. And then you pull your, your phosphate or phosphorus number from your I regular ICP. And then on their little calculator, it kind of tells you where you're at for your uh, nitrogen, your phosphorus, and then your carbon kind of ratio. That uh, NP back to balance is just the easy button for keeping some or enough carbon in there to kind of keep things happy. You know, sump obviously, even if you have socks, you're gonna get detritus in there. So what we've done over the years is kind of like you see all the platforms that the corals are on. I basically beefed up one of those to put, you know, all the weight of live rock on it. So we have two of those in the sump that act as a stand so I can get in there and vacuum underneath. Awesome. And it just makes it easy to keep, yeah, good idea. keep the stuff out of there, you know? You do not have none of the filter socks or filter roller, nothing like that. Right, right now I don't. So what do you have full filtration? You have obviously this camera in the back. I think. Um, yeah, I've got an Octopus External 300. We used to have this turf scrubber, which worked wonderfully, right? But no, no. now I don't need you it, don't you know. Need it. No. Okay, so uh, everything you have is just a skimmer? Yeah, skimmer and then the live rock and the sump and the plumbing and all the other places that all the bacteria grow on, all, all the right. surfaces. Exactly. That's literally it. Yeah, I mean, you're looking at what takes a lot of the, all the nitrogen, all the phosphorus and all the carbon out of the water, right? That's, that's what's using them, right? All the, all the life that's in there. Exactly. Mainly the bacteria, right? That both are 
on the surfaces and that live in the coral tissue. You know, that's the building blocks of life. It's, um, that's what they all need.